Welcome to the new episode of African Europe Insight by the Sonny Ofehe Show. In this episode, we look at the life and achievements of my mentor and environmental activist from Nigeria, Reverend Nimo Basi. Happy viewing. All is extracted with absolute disregard for the environment. The fossil fuel industry is dangerous, polluting, harmful, destructive, warmongering, and should be stopped. I live in Nigeria, a country that has depended on revenue from crude oil and gas for some decades now. In 1956, the first oil field was set up in the Niger Delta. Thirty years later, the oil industry was the major source of income for Nigeria. By that time, the head of the government of Nigeria, a military head of state, said the problem of Nigeria was not money, but how to spend the money. The government of Nigeria is very rich, but the people of Nigeria are not rich. And that disconnect is the problem that I confront in my daily work. I stand before you today, not just as an individual, but as a representative of suffering peoples in the oil fields of Nigeria and in oil fields around the world. I stand before you representing peoples oppressed and devastated by the unyielding claws of mineral and other resource extracting companies in the backwaters of the world. These people I represent may be faceless, but today, in all humility, I stand to salute their courage and to declare that the recognition of my struggles by the Right Livelihood Award Foundation is a clear recognition of the just cause of the resistance of the marginalized peoples who subsidize the world's insatiable loss for fossil fuels with their own blood and at the cost of the environment and means of livelihood. I stand on the shoulders of heroes of the struggles and recall at this time a very striking stanza of the national anthem of my country, Nigeria, which says, the labors of our heroes past shall never be in vain. I salute the courage of Ken Sarawiwa and all the other heroes who towed the non-violence resistance path and laid down their lives in the process. Their labors shall indeed not be in vain. I read a lot about people like Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X, and their activism in the US really uh, made me see why standing for justice was so very important. And then, of course, I saw simple, ordinary people uh, bring about big changes because of the way what they did. I read Gandhi. Then there were a lot of South African students, and we were schoolmates, and then we could learn more about what they had to escape from apartheid, then apartheid South Africa. So there were a number of issues that got me uh, to question even the Nigerian system and what was happening on the African continent. Born 1958, is a Nigerian architect, environmental activist, author, and poet who chaired Friends of the Earth International from 2008 to 2012. He was the executive director of Environmental Rights Action for 20 years. He was one of Times Magazine's heroes of the environment in 2009. In 2010, Nimo Basi was named co-winner of the Rights Livelihood Award an alternative of the Nobel Prize for Peace. He was also awarded the Rafto Prize. He served on the advisory board and is a director of the Health of Mother Earth Foundation, an environmental think tank and advocacy organization. He was active on the human rights issues in the 80s when he served on the board of directors of the Nigerian Civil Liberties Organization. In 1993, he co-founded the Nigerian NGO known as Environmental Rights Actions, Friends of the Earth Nigeria. In order to advocate, educate, and organize around environmental human rights issues in Nigeria. The Right Livelihood Organization has this to say about him, 
when he was honored. Nemo Basi's indefatigable work with national and international organizations had turned him into one of Africa's leading advocates and campaigner for the environment and human rights. When I got a call that I had been selected as a winner, I was really absolutely stunned. While the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change gathers the nations of the world to talk about how to tackle climate change, the real structural causes are scattered and unacknowledged. With the world running on the machines of competition and massive consumption, it is clear that we need more than one planet to meet humankind's appetites. It is also clear that for current levels of extraction, accumulation, and consumption, ethics have to be overthrown and impunity enthroned. It could not be otherwise, because as the world seeks cheap energy, someone has to pay for it. There are regular losses, oil spills, from these very ancient pipelines that crisscross the creeks and the lands of the Niger Delta. I receive reports of oil spills almost every day. I receive reports of conflicts and rising, brewing, building up conflicts regularly in the oil fields, the grabbing of people's lands, pollution of people's farms and creeks. Basi has stood up against the practices of multinational cooperation in his country and the environmental devastation they leave behind, destroying the lives and ignoring the rights of the local population. For revealing the full ecological and human horrors of oil production and for his inspired work to strengthen the environmental movement in Nigeria and globally, he got their highest award in 2010. The Nigerian activist Nemo Bassi was in Stockholm, Sweden last night to receive the Right Livelihood Award, known as the Alternative Nobel. He won the award along with Brazilian-Austrian Bishop Erwin Krautler and representatives of organizations support activities for poor producers of Nepal, as well as Physicians for Human Rights Israel. He spoke in the Swedish parliament last night at the Right Livelihood Award ceremony. It is time to say no to the pretense that agrofuels can replace fossil fuels or that they are renewable and green when it is clear that they are not. The focus on agrofuels has led to massive land grabs in Africa. This has meant marginalization of the poor, pressures on food supplies, diversion of land from food crop production, deforestation, and abuse of human rights, to mention just a few. It has also been seen by the biotech industry as a crack in the door, allowing them to introduce genetically engineered crops where such would ordinarily be resisted and rejected. It is time to establish an international climate crimes tribunal as proposed by the People's Agreement, drawn up in April 2010 at Cochabamba, Bolivia. Such a tribunal would function in a way comparable to the International Court of Justice, where crimes against humanity are tried. The Climate Crimes Tribunal would try any sort of environmental crime that harms Mother Earth and does the right of the people to a safe environment. This would be seen as crimes against humanity. Culprits to be tried would include polluters, such as those in the extractive industry. It would also put corporations as well as their directors in the dock for climate and environmental crimes, which are in effect crimes against humanity. Permit me at this point to remember a man who fought courageously against environmental damage by a dangerous machinery of state and the corporations. Ken Sarawiwa, who received the Right Livelihood Award in 1994, a year before he was hanged by the military that was in power in Nigeria then. He stood for nonviolent resistance to erosion of environmental rights and sociopolitical justice. Although he lost his life at the hands of undemocratic forces, the party charted remains the only way viable, the only viable option and way out of the Niger Delta quagmire. I salute the courage of all those who told this path for the resolution of conflict. I salute the suffering communities and peoples resisting destructive extraction. It is their courage that sustains our struggle. In solidarity, we march ahead and we will not give up. Thank you very much.
In an interview with the UK Observer of May 30, 2010, he said, We see frantic efforts being made to stop the spill in the US. But in Nigeria, companies largely ignore their spills, cover them up and destroy people's livelihood and environments. The Gulf spill can be seen as a metaphor for what is happening daily in the oil fields of Nigeria and other parts of Africa. In his book, To Cook a Continent, he gave a vivid explanation of how myself, a Dutch member of parliament, Ms. Sharon Hesthausen, and himself in the company of Uber community people were harassed and detained where we visited the gas fuel location belonging to Shell in Nigeria by the Nigerian military wing of the Joint Task Force. In 2010, he was ordained as a pastor. I first met Nimo Basi in Amsterdam in 2009. From that moment on, he became one of living role model. If you are an environmental activist, human rights activist, there's a limit to how much you can protect yourself. The best defense we have is to stand with the people, understand what the people want, understand what their right is, and to stand for the truth. You stand for the truth, I believe truth, truth is the best defense. What is important to me is solidarity. And we have to be able to link our hands together and work together. That's the way to survive in the battle. From this distant vantage point, the Earth might not seem of any particular interest. But for us, it's different. Consider again that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. The aggregate of our joy and suffering, thousands of confident religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines, every hunter and forager, every hero and coward, every creator and destroyer of civilization, every king and peasant, every young couple in love, every mother and father, hopeful child, inventor and explorer, every teacher of morals, every corrupt politician, every superstar, every supreme leader, Every saint and sinner in the history of our species lived there on the mote of dust suspended in a sunbeam. The Earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that in glory and triumph they could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. We declare our right on this earth to be a man, to be a human being, to be respected as a human being, to be given the rights of a human being in this society, on this earth, in this day, which we intend to bring into existence by any means necessary. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings. How eager they are to kill one another. How fervent their hatreds. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point of pale light. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot.
the only home we've ever known. The corporations have essentially colonized governance structures in the world today. And they would do anything to secure their interest. And with regard to energy resources and other minerals, we have seen increasingly that states are now considering their energy security as being the same as national security. And this security is being defined by the interests of transnational corporations or resource extracting corporations. We've seen this kind of overbearing presence and control of government by corporations has led to wars in many parts of Africa, many parts of the world. The resource wars in Liberia, in Sierra Leone, in Sudan, in the Congo Democratic Republic over the years have been foiled by corporations who hide behind governments to create mayhem and to grab the resources. Because in every situation, where no matter how intense the conflict has been, resource extraction does not halt. And somehow, the battle always goes around the periphery of the region where the extraction is taking place. They never bomb the mines or bomb the miners. They just go around, secure those areas, and they're just enclaves of extraction and exploitation while everything else gets destroyed. And we've seen this increasingly so uh, in Iraq, in, in places in Africa, you know, it just continues. And I watched The Age of Stuff, I mean, the, the Story of Stuff by Annie Leonard. And one of the clips really captured my imagination. It's a cartoon there where government is shining the shoe of transnational corporations. So I see clearly that governments today have become the shoe shine boys for transnational corporations. If it, it, it looks like we've surrendered our sovereignty to corporations. There was a time when corporations were ruled territories on behalf of governments. But now, governments are ruling territories on behalf of transnational corporations. So wars are being fought. The destruction of Libya was done to grab resources and also possibly also to checkmate the growing influence of the Chinese. So we're beginning to see instances where geopolitics and resource politics is beginning to play out in this sense. I've seen over the years that the real pressure is only built when the people who are impacted stand up for their rights. Since 1999, we've been under democratic structures. And, and so it's, it's a lot easier to mobilize and to work with local communities to defend the environment. Friends of the Head International has members in 76 countries of the world. I was inspired to nominate him as the main speaker when we organized the 15th Remembrance of Ken Saruwiwa in The Hague in 2010, an event that was jointly organized by Hope for Niger Delta Campaign, Amnesty International, Friends of the Earth, Netherlands. In 2014, he received the Nigerian National Honor for Environmental Activism as a member of the Order of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, MFR. And we love to work with farmers, with movements, as a stand for justice. He was also a member of the just concluded National Conference of 2010. I sat with him at his modest office in Benin City to discuss about his life, activism, awards, and the burning issues of the National Conference. We build our work on the basis of solidarity. And it is not, frankly speaking, it is not an easy thing to do. Because, as I said, people are coming from different cultural experiences and coming together to confront issues even when they're global people tend to have different perspectives yes. and take off points and so what we do is to recognize our diversity mm -hmm. and build upon that as a strength and this 
closely links up to the kind of work we do at home and in our various nations. Because everybody has a reality. And everybody is working. Everyone in the Federation is working from a grassroots perspective. Mm -hmm. And people have asked me, do you have grassroots people in Europe, in North America? Yeah. And the, the, you know, the answer is yes. But wherever anybody is adversely impacted, wherever environmental justice is inflicted on anybody, those people suffering those impacts constitute a grassroots. Can you briefly summarize the environmental situation in the Niger Delta now with all the experience that you have in this uh, area? Yes, the, the Niger Delta is a particularly challenged region in Nigeria. The conflict in the Delta began when the first drop of oil was extracted commercially from mm -hmm. that region. Yeah. And we would simply say this started from 1958 when Shell began to commercially extract and export oil. And, you know, there was a lot of hopes. People had hopes. Mm. Development is coming, progress is coming, we're going to have this and have that, schools, roads, clinics. But over the years, all these hopes have been dashed. Yeah. I mean, this is well documented. You hear it from everybody you're going to talk to. Mm. But, you know, over the years also, there has been a cumulative build-up of crisis. In there. Apart from the problem challenges, crises of different dimensions have been building up. At the beginning, people had faith in the government to deliver. When government did not deliver, they shifted their hope to the corporations, mm -hmm. the oil corporations. And then the corporation failed the people. And now people resorted to helping themselves. And they found that there was no longer the supporting environment for them to help themselves. So people have been pushed to the a wall. corner. They've been pushed to the wall. And then you began to see the manifestation of the responses that we're experiencing. So the, the problem basically is that the Niger Delta people are very hard-working people, very accommodating people, very peace-loving people. Mm -hmm. But since all became the major revenue Enter in this country. Both the governments and the corporations have taken the position that nothing must disturb the flow of that revenue. Mm. And what this means is that environmental concerns have been pushed out of focus. In other words, if we need to destroy the environment to get all the money, so be it. If we need to kill all the people to make all the dollars, so be it. So petrol dollars and crude oil have become the gods of the government and the oil corporations. It's profit at any cost. Yeah. And this is why over the years, whether under the military or under the sea, in fact, there, there have been more fatalities in the Niger Delta. More people have been killed in the oil field under the civilian administration than the military regimes. Apart from the Nigerian Civil War, which was in the, in the 60s. We have the cases like the OD incident in 1999, where over 2,800 people were killed. You have Odioma incident. You have, now you have the current ones going on in, at Baramatu, mm. and Boroza, and the other places. Mm. But the basic challenges of the region has been a lack of willingness by government and by corporations to sit down and talk with the people. Uh, what is your take on the current, uh, current crisis going on and with the fighting between the government forces and, and the militants? And uh, what, uh, what, what do you think is, should be the immediate solution? The immediate solution is a ceasefire on both sides, both from the, the joint tax force and also Militant. the militants who have taken up arms. The, the conflict is completely regr is regrettable and is totally unnecessary. Because the issue that led to the to violent confrontation have been on the ground for long enough for government to take action to stop it. So I put the blame squarely on the doorsteps of the president of Nigeria, who is the commander in chief of the armed forces. He has to take responsibility for all the deaths, all the destruction, because he has permitted all corporations to start with to continue polluting and to continue reducing the life expectancy of our people. Because people will die in, as they go from a bullet or a bomb. But people are dying every day from the pollution. So either way, we're adding up to a situation of conflict which is completely unacceptable. 
But that we're just talking about the exploration yeah, yeah. and the exploitation. But along with the extraction of crude oil, we have gas flaring. Much has been said about it. Government keeps shifting the deadline for gas flaring to stop, mm. and there doesn't seem to be any end to this shifting of the goalpost. Mm -hmm. December 2008 was the last deadline, and now government is saying 2011. And the corporation, all corporations are saying 2013. Mm -hmm. When is it going to end? Who are we going to believe? Where can the people hope to have a quiet night, a, a quiet sky? Where can the people hope to have less of these pollutants in the atmosphere? You talk about life expectancy in Nigeria. The average man in Nigeria expects, expects to live for 46 years. Mm. The average woman expects to live for 47 years. In the Niger Delta, it is 41 years. Over 60% of the people in, Niger, of people in Niger Delta are below 30 years old. Why? Because of the pollution. To me, the greatest violence against the people is not the shooting with guns. It's the violence of the environmental pollution. Because we need to have the environment in Niger Delta clean up. This is the challenge that we face. Indeed. Today, I have dedicated this episode to a man who has defended the environment despite the risk to his life, so that we all can live in a sustained and clean environment. Nemo Basi, we all appreciate your work and we pray that as God has called you to serve him, he will use you more to achieve his purpose for us all in this world. Once again, thank you all for being part of African Europe Insight. See you again next week, same day, same time. God bless you for watching. Thank you. Bye-bye.